Hi, my name is uh, Srini Kalika. Um, I'm a director of software engineering at Capital One. Um, and I'm very honored and thankful to Cloud Academy for this opportunity to present the serverless framework. As part of my day job, I work as an enterprise divisional architect at Capital One, guiding teams migrating systems from on-premise to the cloud. We have a mandate to move all the systems to the cloud by end of 2018. It's a tall order. Rather than doing a lift and shift, we are looking to exploit the agility and uh, capability of the cloud to redesign these systems uh, to be cloud native from ground up and FB uh, cost conscious. And that's where um, uh, the serverless strategy comes into play. We are employing serverless strategy for as many designs as possible. Uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. Rather, we are going to explore the power of serverless framework, building an application that will use the serverless uh, framework to recognize celebrities using 100% serverless um, um, model and design. So, but before we uh, take a look at the serverless uh, framework, um, so I want to be, uh, I just want to make sure that we are all on the same page as to what is serverless architecture. Uh, the serverless uh, computing model is an emerging trend and quite often is misunderstood because of the hype and build up surrounding the topic. The term serverless refers to building applications without having to configure or maintain the infrastructure required for running the app applications. But as you know, in reality, servers are still involved, though they are owned and uh, controlled by the platform providers. So, um, um, so this this technique of building um, this technique of building applications using serverless architecture is also known as function as a service. The momentum behind the serverless uh, started in late uh, 2014 when Amazon introduced their AWS Lambda service in, in their uh, reInvent annual event. So this was uh, soon followed by other major uh, uh, platform, uh, cloud platform providers such as uh, IBM with their OpenWhisk, um, Microsoft with their Azure functions, Google with their Azure functions, and more recently, Oracle has also joined the fray. Uh, if you believe Gartner, by 2022, most of the cloud architecture as we know today is going to be rendered um, a legacy architecture um, because the way we are building today uh, needs to change um, from the monolithic model that we're used to into a serverless model. So um, the other thing uh, to note here is, if you, if you recall in the early days of cloud computing, there was a promise uh, that was made. It said a cloud computing would offer the uh, agility and capability on demand at a value price. The serverless, uh, serverless uh, model of building application actually delivers on that promise. So um, um, I'm going to, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, skip a couple of slides. But basically, um, the idea behind um, uh, the, uh, the technique of building uh, applications using serverless architecture, as I mentioned earlier, is also called function as a service. And it has um, a few attributes that are specific to uh, FAS. The reason becomes clear when you contrast FAS applications with the traditionally built applications where there's a perpetual process running on a server waiting for HTTP requests or API calls to occur. In FAST, there's no perpetual process, but an event mechanism that triggers the execution of a piece of code, usually a function, and you still need some kind of a perpetual gateway that will field your API calls um, to, start the, uh, to start the process and for the events to cascade. So the other key operational difference um, between pass and traditional application is scaling. With most traditional solutions, you still need to worry about scale. With pass, the compute resources are provided at a request level. 
So this granular, uh, it, it is, it is um, so the functions are built very granularly. You cannot get the same level of granularity with traditional applications, even if you set it to auto scale. As a result of this, FAS applications are extremely efficient when it comes to managing cost. But then um, it's not all, uh, um, uh, there, there are some limitations for FAS. Um, some of that is a state because of the, um, the short-lived nature of uh, uh, short-lived na nature of the app, uh, the functions. Um, the state of the application should be managed externally uh, from the FAS infrastructure. Uh, uh, usually, you use a cache or you offload it to a database. And then, because of the on-demand provisioning nature and low cost, there is a restriction on how long your functions are allowed to run. So to keep the prices low, your bill by minutes of usage, and some providers such as Amazon restrict the duration uh, of, a duration of time a function is allowed to process. If you recall, we discussed about uh, AWS Lambda. Uh, AWS Lambda, um, the current limitation is five minutes. So uh, um, the, the key takeaway uh, here is uh, state between requests must be maintained outside of the function. Uh, other uh, other limitations are resource limits. Um, sometimes some providers, uh, such as Amazon, uh, they have a limitation on the size of your deployment package. This could be severely restricted, uh, restricting for uh, some imaging applications, which depends on large libraries. Also, uh, there are uh, limitations on concurrent function execution. And some of these limitations are soft limitations, and you can work with the providers to to get that changed. So the idea is you got to use it wisely. Um, the the other limitations are latency. Um, uh, depending upon depending upon the language that you use, uh, for instance, if you use um, Java or Scala in your functions which in turn uses JVM, there's a time that's required for, because it's uh, provision on demand, there's a time it takes to spin up the JVMs. So providers are optimizing this, but still you gotta be, um, uh, you gotta be aware of this fact and make sure that you test your perform uh, performance of your applications regularly. On the other hand, um, um, you won't see much difference in uh, interpreted applications such as uh, Python and JavaScript because um, they get uh, uh, they, uh, the, the functions get passed at runtime. time. So irrespective of whether it is on on prem or on uh, um, on a lambda function, it's going to take the same time. All right, we we looked at this one. Um, if you want to uh, learn more about um, serverless, uh, uh, serverless framework, serverless architecture, um, Cloud Academy has some great resources um, which are uh, listed here. So um, speaking of serverless uh, and serverless framework, um, one story comes to my mind. This was. Uh, a while back, the Australian Bureau of Census, they uh, spent millions of dollars building a site to allow for the Australian citizens to to go and provide, uh, to log in online and provide their census information and stop officials going door to door. So uh, this was built after, uh, it took a long time, they built it on premise, um, and when it went live, it probably crashed. Um, they they had uh, uh, they had multiple issues on this thing and uh, um, finally I think it worked out. Uh, but the fun part was um, two college uh, two school kids um, during a hackathon they cloned this uh, site and for less than five hundred dollars they built uh, built the whole census application uh, using the serverless framework and. They were able to uh, test that uh, with the online uh, load tester, and they were able to um, sustain millions and millions of concurrent hits without running into issue. So it speaks volume about um, this, uh, the serverless architecture and the serverless framework. 
So what is serverless framework? Well, now that we have seen serverless architecture, uh, let's take a quick look at serverless framework. So um, organizations, uh, um, big organizations are always like to diversify the risk and don't want to be uh, bound to a single provider. And it, when, when, when you think about it, um, not having to manage infrastructure by using serverless function is nice, but having to deal with hundreds of function in a large project, uh, large application, is going to be a nightmare because you got to uh, deal with multiple providers. Uh, when I say providers, I mean multiple cloud providers. You have to manage buckets. Um, you have to manage messaging. Uh, permission, uh, all that becomes an issue. And also, as you diversify and use multiple uh, providers, you got to learn the different terminologies used by the various providers, their function, their services they offer, and uh, their command line interface and commands. So this is where um, serverless framework comes to play. Um, it comes to the rescue. It's an MIT open source project. It was actively built, uh, built and maintained by a community. Um, has a lot of following. Um, it allows you to provision and deploy uh, RESTful APIs, backend services, data pipelines, and also solves other use cases by providing a, um, a framework and a command line interface to build these services. So the important point about serverless framework, it, it's, it not only um, uh, allows you to um, build and deploy, it can also manage your code. So it manages your code as well as your infrastructure. The core concepts of serverless framework. The serverless framework, um, it, uh, the idea behind serverless framework um, is there is a main service, uh, which basically is a unit of organization. Um, this uh, service, as a matter of fact, and a project can have multiple services. It's uh, you. In the service, you define your functions. A function could be, um, for example, in this uh, example that you're seeing here, um, um, so you have uh, um, um, two functions, um, create users and delete users. And then these uh, functions are triggered uh, by events. That events here are basically HTTP events, which um, which gets triggered when somebody uh, goes uh, calls uh, the URL uh, with users create or users delete at the end. Now, um, the whole uh, service is defined in a file called, uh, configured in a file called uh, serverless.yaml. It's a YAML file, um, much more uh, terse than an XML file and more readable than a, a JSON file. Um, so, I'm trying to see why my screen, okay, there you go. Um, and as I mentioned, a function is an independent unit of deployment. It could be a microservice. It manifests itself as Lambda and AWS world, Azure function, and Microsoft. It, it, it's built to be um, very terse in what it does. It's, it's uh, uh, often written to perform a single task like saving a user to the database, processing a file, performing a scheduled task, uh, so on and so forth. Um, again, as you see in the example here, you have a function I'm calling it hello. It has a, uh, you define what is the entry point for that using the handler uh, preface. You provide a name, description. You can specify the runtime. You can specify uh, how much memory it should use. You can specify the timeout limit. Uh, after the timeout limit, uh, you, it, it can uh, it can run up to five minutes on uh, on Lambda. Uh, after that, it's going to uh, shut down. So you got to make sure that your functions do not exceed the limits provided by the uh, cloud provider. Anything that uh, so now that we've seen what a function is, now um, there is some. Uh, the, the way the function gets triggered is via events. 
And this events could be, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it could be a HTTP request coming in through the gateway. It could be somebody loaded a, uh, loaded a file or updated a file on S3. It could be a CloudWatch timer, which is set to run every five minutes. Every five minutes, your Lambda will be called. It could be a message on the SMS topic. Uh, it could be uh, based on something that has happened. Um, this is uh, basically useful for alerts. So um, uh, the, the interesting part about this is, uh, as I mentioned um, uh, earlier, a way, like for example, if you're using SMS, the, the beauty about the serverless framework is it will automatically create all the infrastructure that's necessary for that event to occur. So for example, if you are, if you are based on HTTP uh, events, the gateway would be automatically uh, configured for you. If it's a SMS topic, that will, uh, uh, the SMS topic will be created for you. So that, that is a very interesting concept and very useful concept. So you don't have to worry about those plumbing details. Um, we have seen an example of this before. Um, the other thing is, for those uh, functions to run, you need resources. And the resources uh, could be um, where the function uses to saving the users, or it could be a, a Dynamo DB table, it can be a S3 bucket, or the topic. As I mentioned earlier, all these uh, resources are automatically created for you. Uh, this is an example where you define the resource, um, uh, basically saying uh, you want to use a DynamoDB table, and you specify the uh, attributes, and then uh, the framework will will uh, provision it for you. Uh, obviously, um, to be able to operate those uh, functions, you need the right credentials, and um, there are two options here. You can specify the credentials that you want to use provided that you already um, um, already configured it on the cloud provider, or uh, you can let the serverless framework create it for you. So, uh, so depending upon your use case, uh, you might want to use either one or the other. Uh, once, once you have created the YAML file uh, with your service configuration, to deploy the service, all you have to uh, all you have to do is um, call serverless deploy, um, and that should de deploy the whole uh, whole um, uh, service. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, a service can have multiple functions. So um, when you deploy um, a YAML file, the serverless YAML file, all the functions will be deployed. If your function, uh, if your service uh, defines three functions, three lambda functions will be created on AWS. And you'll see an example of that. Um, if you want to specifically deploy a, a single function, let's say you made some changes to a function and you don't want to deploy the other functions, then you can specify that function alone. So that is also possible. Um, the other thing that's, uh, that's interesting is you can invoke, um, so, um, if you want to test your function before you actually uh, do something on the cloud, you can test it locally by calling serverless invoke local, and that should uh, invoke the function. Um, you can also invoke the function directly um, that's uh, deployed on the cloud using the serverless invoke function. You don't provide, you don't specify local here, and this will basically go and call the function in the right staging environment on the cloud. So that is a quick uh, overview of the serverless framework. Um, now, uh, let's take a look at the um, application. The application, um, basically, um, that we are going to use has this, uh, I'm just going to go to the design um, and describe the application, and then I'll show you a demo of the application. Um, the Celebrity Sleuth is uh, the name that I provided for this application. Uh, what it does is it, it, it will, uh, the, the idea behind this use case is, 
let's say that there's a celebrity on on, a, on TV that you are trying to figure out who it is. Um, you can take a picture of that uh, person uh, using your uh, uh, using your uh, cell phone. Um, the camera on your cell phone, and then use SMS to send the message, uh, send the send the image along with some commands. Um, so here you're using the using the cell phone uh, um, as a UI, uh, the SMS as a UI, and uh, you are since it's uh, going to be preformed, there's a certain grammar that you have to use to ensure that you're sending the right commands. Um, that SMS message is uh, intercepted by Twilio. Twilio is a messaging service. Um, um, so, as a result of, uh, you need to sign up for a uh, sign up for a the Twilio service. Um, they had uh, uh, they had uh, they had some pre um, numbers that you can use for a certain period of time before you can make your uh, make your mind. So, I'll encourage you guys to sign up and play around with it. And uh, basically, what it does is uh, it takes the message that you send, intercepts it, and based on the configuration that you provide, it will call a certain RESTful API. In this particular case, uh, we're going to call um, the API gateway on Amazon, uh, which then would uh, push it to uh, a set of services. And we'll take a look at those services. Basically, there are Two sets of services that uh, um, that we have um, for this application. One is the request processor. Other one is a response processor. That's the first lambda here uh, as a request processor and response processor. This is the this is a service which is basically responsible for talking to Twilio. The actual uh, face uh, recognition software um, is being uh, dealt by this um, middle set of services um, called uh, face recognition service. This one in turn uses uh, AWS recognition um, and also for matching, if a match uh, faces, uh, face matches found, it will uh, also go to IMDB and then get the biography of the person. So these three sets of uh, services, one is basically to create a collection. You can, uh, a collection is nothing but a small database of faces. Uh, and uh, um, and then uh, it, it basically you, pro, you specify that you want to create a, a database. And then after that, you can keep adding faces to it. Uh, this adding phase is basically to train the, train the recognition. Um, as some faces added, um, you, it will uh, um, AWS recognition um, will find vectors in your face, uh, vectors in that face, and then store those details. It doesn't actually store the image; it just stores the uh, vector. It's like a, like a vector is nothing, uh, nothing but like a fingerprint of a particular face. And then uh, next time when you say uh, match the face, it will uh, then um, find the vectors in the face that you want to match. And then compare those vectors with the vectors that's already stored in the AWS recognition database. If it's a match is found, uh, then it will give you the identification uh, for that name, and then you use that identification to look up the look up the biography of the uh, person. So um, the code for this is in my GitHub site, uh, Escalica Faces, and uh, the, as I mentioned, there are two main services, uh, Twilio Communication Service and Face Recognition Service. So let's uh, let's take a um, let's take a quick uh, walkthrough of this application, uh, and then we'll look through the code. Uh, all right. So okay, this is uh, basically an image of uh, my phone. Hoping that you are able to see that, um, I am going to find the picture. Um, this is a, I've already trained. Uh, I've already trained uh, the software um, with the face of Sean Connery. So let's see if we can find.
So I'm asking, uh, I'm giving a command and saying mash the face um, in the database called setups. And let's wait for a response back. Uh, as you can see, uh, it did uh, match the face and found out it was Sean Connery. Um, came back with a list of uh, uh, brief biography of the person. Um, so let's see how this works. Um, I'm going to open a new terminal here. So uh, first and foremost, um, you need to install Python. Um, and assuming that you have done that, um, uh, I have uh, installed Anaconda. Um, so I'm going to create a new um, uh, a, a new uh, virtual environment here. Uh, I'm going to call it um, Cloud Academy 2. And I'm going to use Python 2. So, all right, so my virtual environment is created. I'm going to activate it. Um, if you're a Windows user, then uh, you might have to use activate faces instead of source activate faces. And all those instructions are in the GitHub page. All right, so now that we have created it, uh, I'm going to um, create a directory um, where I'm going to check in my code. And then here I'm going to clone. Um, I'm going to clone my uh, GitHub page. So as I mentioned, if you uh, don't already have a Twilio number, sign up for Twilio, get a trial phone number with MMS capability. Um, looks like you might you'd be able to use this for a 30-day period, um, uh, after which you have to either sign up again or pay for it. Um, OK, so I've downloaded the code. I'm going to get into that one. And here, uh, basically, um, uh, for Twilio to work, you have to set up uh, the Twilio credentials. And basically, your, uh, when you sign up for Twilio, your SID goes here, your authorization code goes here, your, your from number and to number goes here. So I have already done that um, elsewhere. So I'm just going to copy it from there. All right, so um, I have set up uh, my credentials there. Um, now I can test this thing. 
Um, so to be able to test it, uh, all I'm doing is, um, and I'll, I'll walk you through the code if we have the time, what the code does. Basically, it, um, oh, um, well, I set it up, but I didn't source it. Source. All right. Uh, so my environment variables are set now. All right, so let's see if this thing comes through. Um, it's uh, basically what uh, this will send a static message to my uh, Twilio. Uh, you see this? This one basically came through. This um, uh, it, it goes from this code. So let's take a quick look at what this code does. Um, so um, the main thing is um, uh, basically uh, the code here. Um, I'm getting the Twilio credentials from the environment variable. I'm getting the two number from number. And then all I'm doing is uh, this, this is the main code here, right? Um, I'm creating a message uh, using the Twilio client, which I have imported here. And then I'm specifying the two number from number, and then I'm putting a static message and an image of uh, uh, Neil Armstrong, and uh, that's it. Um, once it's executed, you'll get a message. So if your Twilio setup is uh, correct, um, you should get a message back. All right, so uh, the next step is to ensure that you install a serverless framework. Uh, serverless framework is basically uh, at uh, serverless.com, um, uh, serverless.com framework. Um, once you have that installed, I've already installed, and I don't want to take our time to install it now. So essentially, if you install it, um, and you should be able to verify the installation is right you will get a version number, so it basically tells me that uh, installation is good. All right, so let's quickly test if our installation is uh, fine. So I'm going to create a tester directory. Uh, oh, by the way, um, so you can either type in serverless uh, for the command line CLI, or you can just say SLS for shot. So I'm using uh, uh, SLS, I'm saying create a new uh, service, and I'm using uh, Python, and I'm using AWS. Basically, by saying AWS Python, my cloud provider is AWS, and uh, I am calling the service um, SLS test. So this should actually um, uh, create this, um, um, boilerplate, and the boilerplate is basically these two func uh, function and the YAML file. We'll just take a look at what that YAML file looks like. Uh, as you can see, we gave the name SLS test. The provider is AWS, runtime is Python. Um, there are some convenient methods here, uh, IAM roles that you need to, um, uh, you, you have to specify if you want to use your own IAM role. If not, then um, serverless will uh, will uh, provision the right roles for you and then attach it. Um, and then you're basically saying, this is my functions. Uh, in this particular case, this service has only one function. Uh, it's called hello. And the method uh, uh, that uh, inside the uh, um, handler.py is handler.hello. That's all there is. Um, okay, let's take a look at the Python code that I've generated. Um, this is a simple Python. Uh, basically, um, you're calling, um, uh, you're specifying a body, um, saying message goes serverless. Uh, you can change it if you want.
All right. Um, now that that we have the function, we have to deploy it. So now it is packaging the service, um, creating the uh, respective stack, and then uh, pushing it into uh, AWS. It's using the credentials that I have created. Um, uh, if you want, if you guys want to understand how to create those credentials, there are links in my GitHub page. It takes you, uh, shows you how to create it. Basically, creates uh, um, a creden uh, it creates a credentials. Uh, it's in my home directory dot AWS credentials is created and this should have all your uh, proper credentials for your user um, to be able to connect to uh, to AWS. So once that is there, then um, it will make use of that one. All right, so we deployed it and uh, looks like the deployment went through fine. Um, let's now invoke that function. We call, if you recall, we called our function hello. So let's call it and let's see. There you go, hello Cloud Academy, our function executed successfully. So um, basically that is one way um, to test that uh, service. All right, so um, now what we are going to do is um, deploy our Twilio communication service and see how that works. But before that, uh, I just want to quickly show you what it did on AWS side. I already have a window open, so let me make use of that. All right, so um, we deployed those functions two minutes ago. Um, and you see SLS test dev hello was deployed uh, two minutes ago and the function is basically what we uh, had in our Python code. Uh, doesn't have any uh, triggers. Um, so the only way to call this is just through the serverless invoke um, that we did. All right, so next step is Twilio communication. Okay, I'm not wrong directly. Um, and I will show you what this code is as well. Um, I'm afraid I will not have enough time to go through the whole code, but I can show you a new overview of the code in a second. So as you can see, it is creating two functions. One is a process request lambda function, other one is send response uh, lambda function. And just as we saw, let's quickly see um, here, um, these two services were created uh, 24 seconds ago. Um, and the interesting point is uh, because we had configured uh, the Twilio, uh, it created the necessary environment variables um, in this advanced setting, you'll see all the, uh, where is that? There you go. Um, there's the environment variables. So it created those things. Um, so we just want to make sure there's no errors. Um, obviously there isn't. Um, now uh, the next step is to set up uh, Twilio. Um, Twilio is basically, um, and uh, let me pull this one here. You, you go to your Twilio console. In this particular case, uh, since uh, we're running out of time, I'm going to show you that what I already did. 
So celebrity suite, uh, uh, celebrate cell suite is the is the message that I have uh, a messaging service that I've created, um, and I have created this to um, whenever a request comes in, uh, I've asked it to push the uh, request to this um, uh, response service. This, rec 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 this response service is the one that was created by AWS Lambda. So let's take a quick look at that. So uh, it not only created the serverless framework, not only created the Lambda functions, but it should have also created the appropriate gateway. So it is, uh, this, is, uh, this was just created for us. And then if you go to the stage uh, dev section, there's the URL. Um, as a matter of fact, you can see Um, th this is the whole uh, whole URL for that uh, thing that we have to cut and paste and fill you. All right. So since that was already done, um, the next step is to head over to the numbers section and associate this messaging service to the number. Um, so this particular uh, um, uh, this particular uh, number is my number, and it's already associated with this uh, with this messaging function, messaging service. Um, so there's no need to do that again. All right. Um, now uh, the next uh, next thing to do is to um, next thing is to uh, deploy the face recognition service. Um, so before I do that, I want to show you what the yeah, serverless YAML for this one looks like uh, for the Twilio communication service. Um, all right. So um, this is a service that we uh, we are creating, Twilio communication service running on AWS using Python 2.7, using East region. Uh, the, the, uh, the reason why I'm being specific about the US East region is uh, that um, the, AWS recognition service that, uh, that Amazon provides uh, currently is only supported in two regions. One is US East, and one is US, uh, uh, US West Oregon. Um, I heard that they are going to start supporting the, uh, the government uh, uh, region as well, but uh, uh, they might have already, uh, I'm not so sure. Uh, any case, uh, so there are three fun uh, the two functions here. One is to process request, other one is to send response. The process request um, um, deals with uh, two uh, two environment variables. You specify the environment variables, and then you specify the events that it operates on. So whatever is the path for your uh, you know, the URL, it, you know, it takes the path the process request path from there. Uh, uses a, a get uh, HTTP method um, and uses Lambda integration. Uh, basically, uh, here uh, what, what we're saying is uh, when the event comes in, um, integrated with an existing Lambda, um, and uh, and then um, th now the thing is, uh, Twilio uses tw TWI ML. That's their uh, XML uh, language. The, whatever request comes in, it will be in that language. So that needs to be converted into JSON so that um, our Lambda functions understands that. So we are going to create the Lambda function um, from that uh, from that uh, body of uh, Twilio ML, the Twilio XML, uh, by pulling in the uh, two number, from number, and all that from the input parameters. On the way back, going back to um, Going back to uh, Twilio, it again has to be converted back into XML. So you're uh, constructing an XML with the uh, with the JSON uh, body. So that's all there is for that one. And then the send response again is basically uses a um, uh, uses a SMS uh, topic called dispatch response. So whenever a message comes in um, in this uh, SMS, it will uh, act upon it. Uh, let's take a quick look at that. Um, that window. So if you see here, um, so 
So send response, if you, um, if you see the trigger, it is working on the dispatch response. And we didn't create this. This is automatically created for us by uh, the serverless framework. So that's the beauty about it. All right, so um, let's now take a quick look at deploy the face recognition service. All right, so um, the deployment went through fine. Um, appears uh, it went through fine. So let's uh, quickly take a look at the YAML file. Um, make sure that I'm in the right directory. Okay, so here, um, again, it's uh, AWS Python 2.7, but there are three functions here. One is for creating a collection that, as I mentioned, is a database um, that's required to store your, um, uh, because uh, the recognition service itself is a serverless service. Um, so you have to provide all the information for it to work uh, so it can pull the appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, database for you and then use that for your, uh, for your uh, uh, invocation. Um, and then uh, add phase is the other, uh, other uh, method or other uh, uh, function that we are creating. Um, and all of these um, have or uh, are, are triggered based on the events coming to these uh, corresponding SMS topic. Um, in case of create collection, it's create collection request. In case of add phase, it's add phase request. So these are the name of the SMS topics. And that's all there is to this one. Um, all right, so um, now, now that we did that, let's, let's take a look at, uh, let's actually um, send a face and see if it can, uh, where's my phone? All right, so um, let's let's add a collection first. Um, so if I mess up on this, uh, if I mess up on this uh, grammar here, it will come back with the right response or a, a right uh, syntax for your uh, uh, for your commands. So. I'm adding a collection called Celeps. Um Let's see what it says. Um, so um, I can sit here. Um, uh, okay, there it is. Got an error message. Uh, basically, it is saying that the SNS um, topic uh, is not authorized. A, 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 the Lambda function is not authorized to use the SNS topic. As a matter of fact, we can see this on the um, on the Lambda itself. Let's take a quick look at that Lambda Management Console. We go to the function, um, and I think it's Trivial uh, Communication Service Process Request. Uh, monitoring. There's invocation error. So there you see um, basically the same message saying that the um, SMS it doesn't have the appropriate permissions to um, to post that thing. All right, so um, let's see if we can collect that one. So. 
So this is a section that needs to be removed. So this is a topic that I've already created, right? Um, and I'm saying it should now use this topic. Um, and uh, I'm giving the appropriate permission for this topic um, for my uh, for my user. So now that I've created, uh, now that I've given that, I need to deploy this. Um, All right, so we did this thing, and uh, if we try it again, it's going to fail because we have a similar issue in the face recognition service as well. So um, if we had the time, then we could uh, slowly debug it and uh, figure that out. But in the interest of time, I'm going to fix it beforehand. In this particular case, um, we have to give the right uh, permission uh, for using AWS recognition. We want our Lambda function to have the right uh, permissions for AWS recognition. So let's do that. And then deploy that again. Mm, okay. All right, so uh, the function is deployed. Um, let's now um, let's now go to Google, find the image. Let's do Mel Gibson now. Okay, um, now I'm going to first I'm going to add the um, add a um, collection. getting an immediate response. Um, it's saying that Celeps is already created because I created before. You can create a new um, database if you want. And then now I'm going to um, basically, um, the image that we saved, uh, let's add that as a training image. And I'm going to add it to this uh, Um, the name, uh, the way I have put in the name, uh, I'm, I'm separating the first name and the last name with the underscore. Uh, and when it spits it out, when, when it goes to IMDB, it takes this uh, 
uh, removes that uh, token in between and then uh, does a search based on the first name and last name. Oops, uh, I need to attach that image. So, Okay, Mel Gibson has been added to the collection. Um, now let's go back to Google, find another image. Uh, let's take this one. All right, so wait for a response. As you can see, that we use a totally different image. It's an older Mel Gibson compared to the one that we used. Hopefully, the facial feature has not changed so much. Keep our fingers crossed. There you go. Um, we're hundred percent confident. That's good. Uh, so that is the application. Um, the way it stands right now, um, there are a few enhancements that can be done. Uh, one is to put the, it's now running, uh, it's not in any VPC, all this, uh, all those uh, Lambda functions are out in the open, um, so that needs to be put in a VPC, uh, so security needs to be boosted. So all those things, i leave it as an exercise for the developers. Um, um, since we only have a few minutes left, I would like to answer some questions. Um, so what is Twilio? What is what is its function here? Um, so as I mentioned, Twilio is that gateway that bridges the SMS world with the internet, with the cloud world, right? In our case, a provider. So as I, as I showed earlier, um, we sign up for a number with Twilio and with the MMS capability, and uh, you can then uh, configure it to uh, forward any request that comes to that number to uh, to a gateway on uh, on your provider. So it's a very useful service for uh, bridging the SMS world and the and the cloud world. Um, is serverless applicable for more complex systems of Lambda functions, meaning that we have several Lambda functions scattered in several directories invoking each other and you won't upload the code archive in the, in the zip possibly in the S3 bucket? Uh, yeah, you can, um, you can use, uh, uh, so you can use serverless uh, whenever you're using Lambda. Uh, makes it, uh, if you have a project with lots of Lambdas, um, you can use the serverless uh, framework to handle that. Uh, as a matter of fact, you can incorporate a uh, serverless framework into your CI CD pipeline uh, to make it a seamless process. Um, there, of course, uh, AWS provides their own uh, um, uh, Terraform or some, some such uh, um, uh, scripting language to do the same thing. Uh, but the beauty about serverless framework is it does a lot more where it manages the code also for you and uh, it allows you to um, uh, allows you to um, create those uh, um, resources for you automatically that you specify in your uh, in your script um, Uh, why is the cloud formation stack being used? So uh, internally, what's, uh, uh, what uh, Twilio does is it converts the converts the um, configuration that you provided in the YAML file into a cloud formation stack, and then deploys the stack. Uh, that's how it uh, it does uh, for AWS. So for uh, Azure, it uses uh, um, Azure's uh, native um, native uh, cloud formation. Um, equivalent uh, to to uh, create that script and then calls that script. So depending upon the provider, it uses the um, uses the corresponding uh, cloud formation stack. Now, 
given that it uses a cloud formation stack, uh, it goes on to um, uh, say that you can, as a matter of fact, use cloud formation stack in your code, uh, in your uh, YAML file, and uh, you can write complex uh, cloud formation stack and push that uh, through your serverless framework. So that's another beauty about it. Um, how easy it is to troubleshoot issues in which Lambda function, the code broke in a series of chain function maintaining a state. Um, well, um, so when you want to troubleshoot, as I was trying to demonstrate uh, with the real communication service, um, you have to go to the CloudWatch uh, logs and then you'll have to figure out. Um, so um, there isn't a way for it to signal that it, uh, it, the, uh, the lambda function fail because this, as you can uh, as you can uh, you might have uh, understood by now um, the serverless framework is more for deploying and working uh, not for monitoring uh, how the lambda function uh, ran so that is still um, and the owners are new to do that uh, for applications that run greater than five minutes, how do we go about using lambda functions? So that's a great question. So, um, so in cases where you have um, lambda functions or you have code, uh, serverless code that needs to run more than five minutes, lambda may not be the right use case, uh, right uh, method for it. But what you can do is, or what we have done in the past is. Um, use the lambda function to uh, uh, to invoke or uh, to, to um, spawn a EC2 instance and run the code in that EC2 instance uh, and you set it up such a way that after the, EC, uh, after the code is run that EC2 instance will be destroyed. So that way um, you can um, uh, use, uh, uh, that could be a long running process. Um, so there you're using the lambda only for um, only for uh, invoking uh, and spawning that EC2 instance. Um, what's the best tool to use? Um, use the serverless, serverless functions on production environment. Um, you can use, uh, I don't know whether you're referring to uh, the CI CD pipeline, um, you can use Jenkins. Um, for uh, incorporating your uh, serverless scripts, uh, invocation scripts. Um, it's basically Unix commands. You can add that to a script and then push that to your Jenkins uh, as part of the pipeline. Um, is it possible to use AWS recognition search Google images for matches instead of handmade database? Not sure what what you're referring to as handmade database here. Um, basically, um, what we are in AWS recognition, there are three things you have to do. First, you have to create a, um, a what we call a database, but actually, it is, you're not creating a Postgres database or Oracle database. You're basically telling AWS to create a, a folder for you. In that folder, you are going to now push in uh, images that. AWS acquisition should uh, train itself with. Um, so, um, well, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say images. Basically, you send the image, and that uh, vectors from that image will be will be uh, pulled out of that image, and that vectors will be stored in the folder. That folder is what I'm calling the database. You're not actually creating a new database. Um, so I see that there's no other questions. Um, uh, if there are, uh, um, I mean, you can always go and uh, take a look at uh, the site, uh, the GitHub site, and that should be uh, able to provide you um, more uh, detailed step-by-step uh, -step instruction on how to build this thing. Um, hopefully, you guys will enjoy as much as I did building it. Thank you.